This is a lecture on primary growth. So in this lecture, we're going to go over what a meristem is and where they're located on trees, characteristics of different categories of primary growth, including buds and so on. And then we'll talk a little bit about phenology, phyllotaxis, and apical dominance and its effect on trees and tree form. Let's start with growth. There are four main steps involved in growth of plants. And first is cell division in a meristem. And we'll talk about exactly what a meristem is in a minute. But it's basically the production of new cells through mitosis from a mother cell. So it's cell division and increasing the number of cells. Then there's cell enlargement. Unlike, for instance, animal cells, which when they enlarge in size, they form additional cytoplasm, for the most part, plant cells expand primarily by taking water up into their vacuole. So you can see that in this diagram that showing that the water uptake basically expands the size of the cell uh, and that water is primarily going into the vacuoles. So there's not a huge um, increase in the amount of cytoplasm. The cytoplasm sort of gets pressed outward against the cell membrane and cell wall. In order for this to happen, there has to be a simultaneous process where the cell wall is loosened so that it can stretch and lay down new material as the cell gets larger. The third step is cell differentiation. And that just means the specialization of the cell. So when cells are initially formed in the meristem and form a daughter cell, they're, they're sort of generic. Um, but this process of specialization results in differentiation and specialization of that cell into whatever it's going to be, whether it's a leaf, leaf cell, a tracheid, uh, whatever. And then finally is the maturation, the final formation of that cell it reaches its final size and it's mature. So those are the four steps of cell growth. So let's talk about meristems. Plants grow through meristems. And the definition of a meristem is a perpetually embryonic tissue that's capable of reproducing itself and other tissues. So the meristems are the places in the plant where new cells are produced. Now, it's sort of interesting because growth in plants is different from growth of most other multi-celled organisms. So let's think about how that's the case. So I'll use an example, as an example, my boys, David and Brian, they're animals and they grow through cell division uh, or mitosis of cells all over their body. So as they grow, uh, their liver gets bigger, their epidermis gets bigger all over, and that cell division is occurring all over their body at different places. That's in contrast to plants where that cell division growth occurs almost exclusively in meristems. So there's two primary, or I shouldn't say primary, there are two types of meristems. There's primary or apical meristems. Those primary or apical meristems are responsible for growth in length or height. And then there's secondary meristems, which are called cambium or cambium. So primary or ap apical meristems are responsible for growth in length or height. And those are located or localized at the tips of shoots and at the tips of roots. So you can see in this diagram, this is the tip of probably a corn shoot. And this shows that at the very tip of that shoot is the apical meristem. So that's the region where there are rapidly dividing cells that are producing growth and length. They're located at the tips of shoots above ground and at the tips of roots. Now, in addition, 
there are meristems that are located between nodes in the shoots of plants. So as the apical meristem lays down tissues, for instance, in a bud, it lays down uh, primordial leaves and shoot parts. And in between those are meristematic regions called intercalary meristems. So those intercalary meristems are also responsible for growth in length or height. So for instance, when a bud bursts in the spring and those preformed shoot parts start expanding, that expansion is due primarily to the action of intercalary meristems. So this, we see this often, for instance, it's really obvious in the growth of pine shoots. So in the tiny, or in the bud of pine, there were tiny little primordial needles. And in between each of those needles in that region of the shoot, those regions continue expanding after the bud breaks. And so most of the expansion of that shoot after bud break is due to the action of intercalary meristems. In addition, intercalary meristems are responsible for expansion or growth of um, young leaves. So again, when the buds expand and young leaves expand, it's intercalary meristems and not the apical meristem that produces that leaf expansion. So primary growth, uh, secondary meristems we'll talk about in another lecture, uh, the next lecture on secondary growth, but I just want to point out they're called, secondary meristem is called a cambium, and it produces growth in thickness, radial growth, and it's located just under the surface of stem branches and roots. So I'll leave secondary meristems at that, we'll talk about that in the next lecture. So primary growth, uh, occurs by laying down nodes and internodes. So you can almost think of the, especially the shoot of a plant or a tree as a series of repeated growth units, which consist of a node, which is a point at which a leaf or, or a branch is attached to the stem, and the internode, which is just the region between two nodes. So sometimes we can think of plant growth as the sequential growth of those, it's just a repeated growth of those node internode segments. The apical meristem is typically protected within a bud and buds have some characteristics. So the definition of a bud is that the, it's the embryonic shoot or part of a shoot along with the apical meristem. So we've all seen buds. And buds consist of bud scales, which is just the outer protective layer of the bud. They contain primordial leaves or leaf primordia, which are just embryonic leaves, which are formed by the apical meristem. And they remain inside the bud until they emerge at bud break and expand. That bud also contains the apical meristem, and then it contains the procambium. So the apical meristem, which in this, this is the close-up of the inner part of a bud. So this is microscopic. So we're zoomed in on the inner part of a bud. So this is the apical meristem. This is a primordial leaf here. And this is another primordial leaf here. So the apical meristem has formed these previously. And it also forms the procambium. So this stained line in this image is the procambium. The procambium is tissue that will eventually become the vascular cambium. So that's interesting. So basically what that means is that the primary or apical meristem forms tissues which will eventually become another kind of meristem, the vascular cambium, a secondary meristem. So it's initially formed by the apical meristem and is contained in the bud. And then you can also in this image see axillary buds. 
They're called axillary buds because they're formed in the leaf axle, which is just the joint in between where a leaf is connected to the stem. So an axillary bud forms in the leaf axle. And those buds can sprout and produce, for instance, lateral branches, either in the year those uh, leaves emerge or later. So those, those are the parts that are inside a bud. So here's an example of a dissection of a bud. These are hickory buds. Uh, so you can see these are pretty large. Took one of those off and sliced it in half. So close up, you can see this is a larger version of what we were looking at in that black and white image. So the apical meristem is down here somewhere. Um, these outer parts are the bud scales that protect the bud. And then these green parts are the um, primordial leaves. They're basically little baby leaves that are inside the bud and wait there until spring when that bud bursts. Just to give you an idea of the size, so in that bud right there, I dissected it and picked out a couple of primordial leaves. So this is a razor blade for scale. So these primordial leaves close up are little tiny hickory leaves. This is the head of a pin. So that gives you some idea of the size of these primordial leaves. They're really small. So those are laid down by the apical meristem and essentially stored in the bud uh, and overwinter there in most cases. OK, so that's an example of uh, that expanding leaf. So what type of meristem stem is responsible for expansion of these leaves to their mature size? Is it an apical meristem, a foliar meristem, intercalary, or either of those? So it's an intercalary meristem, as I noted earlier. Here's sort of a classical botany quiz question. Let's say you have a tree and you hammer a nail into the tree and hang a lantern on it at, say, one meter in height. 10 years later, you come back and the tree has grown significantly in height. Where's the lantern? Is the lantern at the same spot where you left it a meter above the ground? Or has it gone up as the tree is grown in height? So think about that for a second. It's this one, right? The reason for that is because trees, their apical meristems are at the tips of branches and shoots. So in this tree, growth and height occurs from apical meristems in this part of the tree. So there's, there's no growth and height to, to be occurring from the base. So what kind of plants might that be different where there might be an apical meristem in the base? What about grasses? Lots of grasses have their apical meristems at the base near the ground, or in some cases, maybe even a little bit under the ground. That's obviously an adaptation to disturbance, either grazing, um, herbivory, or fire. If a herbivore comes along and eats the upper portion of the grass shoot, the apical meristem is at the base and it can produce more shoots. So the herbivore doesn't eat the apical meristem usually. Uh, or if a fire comes through and burns off the upper parts of the plant, there's still an apical meristem there to produce more shoot. So that's why you can mow your grass and the grass continues growing because you're not cutting off the apical meristems. But trees are not like that, obviously. Sometimes you'll see pictures like this on the internet. Uh, it says a boy went to war in 1914 and left his bike chained to a tree. So they're implying from this photo that they leaned the bike up against the tree. And because they were gone so long, the bike was lifted up as the tree grew. And we just talked about why that isn't the case. This is an interesting photo because that bike is enveloped by that tree. And what happened was someone sometime back laid that bike into um, 
the crook of a branch and secondary growth, growth and width of the stem and the branch grew around the bike, but the bike stayed at the same height. So understanding these mechanisms of growth can help us, for instance, interpret situations that we see in the forest, which can be useful sometimes. So let's talk about dormant, dormant and adventitious buds. Now, not all buds immediately expand. Some remain inactive and may expand much later. So there's two main types of those buds. There's dormant buds and adventitious buds. Dormant buds usually originate in leaf axles. So they are axillary buds that don't sprout in the initial year when they're revealed. So they may stay there and remain dormant or inactive for multiple years. Those dormant buds are connected to the pith by a bud trace. So this cross section of this tree stem shows uh, a number of adventitious, or I'm sorry, dormant buds that sprouted um, at some point. And you can see that these dormant buds are all connected to the pith of this tree stem, the center of this tree stem by a bud trace. So they essentially move out as the tree grows in diameter and remain just under the surface of the branch or stem. And they're connected to the pith by a bud trace. So those dormant buds were initially produced by the apical meristem. So epicormic branches of angiosperms and sprouts of gymnosperms arise from dormant buds. And epicormic branches and sprouts of gymnosperms are really important for its an important adaptation of trees. So I'll give you a few examples. So for instance, this is a photograph taken from the canopy crane, the Wind River canopy crane in Washington state. This is a construction crane in an old growth Douglas fir western hemlock forest. Uh, and you can get in the, the uh, person holder of that crane and be moved around and take a look at the canopies of these 500 year old trees. So this is a great view of an old Douglas fir tree here. And it looks pretty gnarly. You know, these trees have lived for 500 years. They've been battered around. They've been uh, broken by ice. They've had windstorm that have broken the tops out of these trees. But because there are dormant buds in the stem and branches of these trees, they can produce new shoots that produce leaves. So essentially, dormant buds provide a mechanism for rebuilding crown when the crown is damaged. So for instance, probably most of these branches down here were formed by dormant buds. And the apical meristem is long gone, but those dormant buds provide a mechanism for rebuilding the crown when the crown gets damaged. Here's an example in a mulberry tree in my mother-in-law's backyard. Uh, an arborist had cut off a big branch of this mulberry tree. And that damage to the crown triggered the sprouting of a dormant bud in that mulberry. And it's producing new leaves. It's rebuilding crown from that dormant bud. So that will eventually be, that's, you know, in an angiosperm is called an epicormic shoot. In live oaks in Florida, we see this a lot. This is an old live oak in my front yard. Here's a side branch of that live oak. And you can see these branches growing straight up out of that live oak branch. Those are branches. They weren't initially formed and sprouted as that branch was growing out from the apical meristem. They sprouted years later after that branch had grown in diameter. And that branch was probably exposed to light because the crown was pretty open at that point. And those dormant buds sprouted and are producing 
new crown within the older crown of that tree. So it's just an adaptation that enables rebuilding of crown in areas where the tree might benefit from additional leaf area. When trees are topped, so for instance, when there's a hard pruning that takes off the upper part of, of a tree crown, dormant buds in the tips of those cut off branches will sprout and form a new crown. So this is an example of a large tree. This is in the Pacific Northwest. This is probably a black cottonwood that was topped. When I lived in Seattle, I saw lots of ads in the yellow pages for arborists for tree topping. They would advertise this because in the Pacific Northwest, trees grow really big. And also often people's views of Mount Rainier or the other gorgeous Pacific Northwest sites were blocked by large trees. So people would sometimes top those trees. This is considered a poor arboriculture practice for a couple of reasons. One, it destroys the crown form of the tree. So this black cottonwood tree will never look quite like a black cottonwood should look. It's gonna look different. So it destroys the form of the tree. But probably more importantly for an urban forestry perspective is that the connections of these epicormic sprouts to the main stem are relatively weak. Uh, and also those cuts, those topping cuts allow uh, places of entry for pathogens. So there's a weak connection and also ports of entry for decay organisms. And you can get large branches falling off or structural failing of the crown years later, resulting from topping. So for instance, this is an example of a large tree that was topped at this point long time ago. It produced epicormic sprouts and formed quite a large crown. But that point of topping, at some point, pathogens entered, rotted that tree away, and it structurally failed, catastrophically failed big time. So topping in general is a poor arboriculture practice. Epicormic sprouts, that's just a tree adaptation that's a benefit to the tree. It's more benefit for the tree to have a weakly connected branch that has photosynthetic leaves on it than, than to not have that. Okay, so that's just an adaptation of the tree. Now there's another type of inactive bud called an adventitious bud. Adventitious buds are not formed by the apical meristem. They're formed irregularly. We're not quite sure what triggers their formation, but they form in stems and roots around the outside of the stem or root, often on older portions of the stem or root. They don't arise from an apical meristem, and for that reason, they don't have a bud trace going to the pith of the stem. So adventitious buds form root sprouts, or some people call them root, root suckers sometimes, as well as stump sprouts. Both of those arise from adventitious buds. So this is an example, I believe this is gallberry. This is in an area that was recently burned. So the upper portion of these gallberry plants were burned and essentially killed. But the root system of the gallberry remained alive and produced a shoot. So I dug down a little bit and you can see where this shoot of this burned gallberry is arising from an adventitious bud in the lower stem or root system of that gallberry. And that's an adaptation to fire. When you go back after a fire in the flatwoods, just a few days after the fire, you'll see gallberry re-sprouting. And that's an adaptation, in this case, to disturbance caused by fire. Another species that really commonly has sprouts out of its roots is aspen. That, this is an example of root sprouts of aspen. This is probably in a clear cut. 
where the aspen stems have all been cut and the soil's been disturbed a little bit, you see lots of aspen shoots coming up from this uh, shallow root system of the aspen trees. This, this happens in a number of spe species, especially in the populus genus, but it's really common in aspen. And it allows aspen to form large clones. Essentially, a clone is a grove of trees. And if you went and sampled the DNA of each of those tree stems, you would find that they're all genetically identical because they arose from root sprouts from an individual. So for instance, this is a, a nice picture I took in fall in Utah. In the, this, is a, this shows um, aspen trees turning yellow in the fall. Uh, but for instance, some of these trees are yellow. Some of these trees have already lost all their leaves. That is likely showing us differences in genetics among these different spots. So this is probably one clone of aspen that has a particular genetically determined leaf drop phenology. This is an, probably a different clone of aspen. There's a large uh, clone of aspen called Pando, also in Utah, and it is sometimes considered the largest organism on earth. It's a number of acres. Uh, it's an aspen grove. It's a number of acres in size, and it's all derived from root sprouts of one genotype. So at some point, there was a seed, aspen seed, that germinated, and that tree, its upper part died maybe thousands of years ago, but root sprouts have been continually growing from that initial one aspen individual. So that can, that can go on for thousands of years. People have estimated that some of these aspen clones and clones of other species, like uh, there's some desert shrubs that do this as well, they've estimated that some of these things may be thousands of years, of, years old. Now, any individual stem at the surface, the cells in that stem, or even the cells in the root system, have not been there for thousands of years. It's just that that genotype has been replacing itself with new tissue over a period of thousands of years. So really interesting uh, examples in Aspen. And it also sort of challenges our ideas about what an individual is. So anyway, another example of the action of adventitious buds. Here's another one, stump sprouts especially in angiosperms. Often when a tree is cut or broken off near the base, you'll get a number of sprouts that arise from the stump. And this is an example in basswood, tilia, of stump sprouts that, are, that arose from a cut or broken off tree. This is quite a few years later, these, those sprouts are all pretty large. And you'll see this in the forest all the time. You'll be walking through the forest and you see a ring of trees around what used to be a tree stump. Sometimes people call those fairy rings. So that's just an example of the action of adventitious buds in trees. There's some variation among species in the production of epicormic shoots. Some species are, uh, tend to do it more often than others. So for instance, white oaks and red oaks tend to very readily form epicormic shoots, whereas, for instance, white ash produces many fewer epicormic shoots. That might be important from a management perspective if, for instance, you were growing oaks or cherries for furniture or veneer. You would probably need to be careful with how heavily you thin the stand because that thinning, when it exposes stems to light and heat, that can stimulate the production of epicormic shoots, which can then subsequently form knots and degrade the wood quality of wood produced after the formation of that sprout. Whereas in white ash, for instance, that may be less important. So an example of genetic variation in tendency to produce 
epicormic shoots.